Welcome everybody. Um, what I've been asked to do is just to run through a sort of increasingly standardized setup. There's a number of number of us in the server admin community have been working on this for the, uh, nearly a year now, I suppose. It's, it's being used in a, quite a large number of countries um, in one guise or another. Um, it's not specifically about COVID-19. Um, the reason that we came up with this set of deployment tools was um, really to assist with, with um, system administrators to be able to install a reasonably secure um, installation of DHIS2 out of the box. Right. Some people will remember the old DHIS2 tools. I think there's quite a few on this call have used them. Um, a number of people use them for a number of years, but um, for all kinds of reasons, they're not really adequate in today's day and age. So we've come up with a, a sort of next generation version. Um, a, maybe just to dampen expectations a little bit. If people are expecting a sort of setup.exe that an inexperienced person will be able to just run and host their DHIS2, I think they need to think again. Um, if, if you're not experienced in hosting Linux systems, your best bet is going to be to get some support from somewhere. Um, probably outsource it to the likes of BAO Systems, HISP Geneva, HISP South Africa, Blue Square, possibly a number of others who offer this service. It's not a good idea for your DHIS2 system running your COVID-19 tracker to be the first system you've ever administered. Okay, so that's my, that's my spoiler. Um, having said that, if you, if you are going to, to work with DHIS2, it makes sense to do it in a way that lots of other people are doing it too. And that's kind of one of the reasons why we're trying to standardize around this particular approach. Um, I can give you a a little bit of a diagram first, just before we kick off. I don't want to take too much time talking because we need to get installing as well. Um, what we're aiming for, what we're aiming for is a situation like, I've lost it. Where is it? Where's my picture? I have a nice picture somewhere. Is it gone? Ah, there. Aiming for a situation where to meet, I think, quite a lot of people's requirements who are taking a single machine, often a often a cloud, a cloud VPS server from Amazon or Linode or Contabo or um, Teddy Server, some of the common common providers people use. They typically just give you a single box. A single Linux machine. And the problem is we, as most of you know, DHS2 has a number of components to it. And it's not a good idea running them all together in the same in the same memory space and in the same using the sharing the same CPUs. It's not good from a security perspective. It's also not good for a, a from a monitoring and performance tweaking perspective. So what we try to do is to break those pieces up. So each each component you have a proxy uh, you have one or many Tomcats, uh, you have one or many database servers, you have one or many monitoring systems. They run using something called containers inside the, the host box. Um, setting all of this up from scratch is quite a long operation, um, but most of it is fairly easily automated. And I've actually done that. Um, and I'm going to show you that briefly now. There are is the beginnings of a simple ish setup guide you find in the repository here this repository by the way we need to move at the moment it's sitting under my personal bob jaff github we'll move it into the standard dhis2 space i've got a couple of steps here which describe how you go through the installation so i'm not going to go through this document i'm just going to do it 
Um, and I'm going to skip the prerequisites because I've already done that and go straight on to installing. So I have a I have a server here which is relatively empty. It's running on Linode. Um, um, and I've run the setup script on it already and then sort of wound it back so that I can do it again. Um, but what you would do, you, 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 you pull these scripts from JIT and that's described in here. Um, where are we? Well, uh, the JIT clone, um, the tools from the repository. Then you go into the setup directory in there and you'll find that there is a file called containers.json.sample. You need to rename that file to containers.json. This is a configuration file. And just make a few edits in that. I think I've already done it. Yeah, you put in the domain name of your server, um, an email address, and for the moment, it's just these three things you need to do. And then your time zone. Quite important to do the time zone because um, most often the time zone in the place where your system is meant to be serving is not the same as the time zone in the data center where the server is. So you have to be able to set that. Um, it's important to note that you cannot do this with just an IP address. Right? You need to have a fully qualified domain name. That's because the server is, the, the, the setup is, is geared towards using SSL. And there's quite a few things I would need to undo on it to not use SSL, right? So you need to have a full, fully qualified domain name that works and is mapped to your IP address of your machine. You need to have an email address and you need to set your time zone. From there, normally you would just run this sudo lxd setup. Um, I'm not actually going to run that because I've run it already. I'm going to, if you just see what's in it, I'm just going to run the last part of it. <laughs> okay, I don't want to do all of this stuff again. What I want to do is this just run this create containers. SSH there. Now that takes about about seven or eight minutes to run. So while that's running, we can go back and look at the diagram. Um, off it goes. Okay, while it's doing that, let me go, go back to my diagram. We'll tell you what it's doing. Um, okay, in our configuration guide, or in our configuration file, we specified that we want to have a proxy here. Now I'm using Apache 2 as a proxy. I know that there are religious wars to be had about this. Some people prefer to use Nginx. Um, I don't want to go into all of those here. Just I, I've, I've, I've done a lot of work on tuning up my Apache 2 configuration. Tuzo from his Tanzania has recently contributed a, a Nginx content version of it. Um, it needs a little bit of tweaking still to get it into the into the setup. I just merged his commit uh, about an hour ago and actually broke my my install. I had to revert it. But yeah, it sets up a proxy container. It sets up a database. Um, it sets up a little monitoring program called Moonin. Um, you can ignore this thing about encrypted disks for the moment. We're not going to be out of the scope of this discussion. Um, it's important, but it's not something that I've managed to automate and document as yet. Um, the important thing about automating, I mean, we could just like go in and follow the install guide, right? Um, typing sudo nano this and, and what have you. The important thing about automating is that it becomes, it's, it's repeatable and um, you don't have to remember all the little things that you might forget, particularly ar around security. We've done quite a lot in terms of insulating these containers from one another, for example. 
We have, you'll see when they're up and running, we have host based firewalls running on each one. Um, so it's only possible for your Tomcat container, for example, the only thing that can access it is the proxy container, because that's the only thing that needs to access it. Similarly, the Postgres um, um, permissions and things are set up so that when a database is created for this HMIS instance, for example, then nobody else can access that database except that HMIS instance. Um, so yeah, quite a lot of work has gone into on it. In terms of the the containers themselves, I've made use of of um, um, a set of benchmark controls from CIS. You might want to look that up. CIS security. That's one of the many tabs I don't think I have open. I can Google it. CIS security. And tried to go through each container as much as possible. And I've been assisted here by others. I know, for example, Tuzo has done a similar due diligence on his Nginx container. This is quite a nice website, and it gives you gives you a kind of checklists of things to do if you're setting up an Apache HTTP server or a Tomcat or whatever it might be. The, this is sort of many hours of work, right? I mean, the Apache Tom, the Apache HTTP server um, is about 170 pages worth of content of checklists, which we've tried to go through most of those so that the containers are by default set up reasonably secure. They are probably still going, wow, it looks like they are done. Let's have a look. Ah, there you can see, there's our three containers. Right, what we don't have, uh, we'll talk about what's inside them and how to get inside them um, a little bit later. Let's first of all just get something up and running. What we don't have is a, is a DHIS2 instance, so we need to make one. The last step of the installation process is actually to install some scripts. They actually go into a place called user local bin, so that they're in your path. And you can see there's various scripts around backup and creating instances and deleting instances and what have you. Um, what we're going to be doing here, some of these might be again familiar to people who use DHS tools. We're going to create an instance and deploy a war file to it. Then if we do really well, we might try and deploy some COVID-19 metadata. Let's have a go. sudo DHS to create an instance. We'd call it COVID-19 being a topical thing. Uh, one thing that's different, particularly people have used the old DHIS tools, is we need to specify an IP address for it. Because remember, there's, if you see these three machines that are running here, the monitor and the post, they all have IP addresses. By convention, when I start up my Tomcat servers, I start them up on 192.160.10. And if I make another one, I'm going to make it 11. And if I make another one, I'm going to make it 12, etc. The other thing we need to specify when you create an instance is to tell it the name of the database to use, the database server. In this case, and maybe in most cases, you only have going to have one database server. But it's possible. If you've got many trackers, you might want to run each one using a separate database. Because as some of you know, trackers are not always very friendly to databases. Um, Okay, I create an instance like that. Um, this instance is based on Tomcat 9. Um, I've only been trying this for the last couple of weeks, but it seems to be working well. There's a few odd things about Tomcat 9, which took a bit to figure out. Um, generally, it functions perfectly well. Some of the places that it puts its files are slightly different to if you're using Tomcat 8.5, particularly the Catalina.out seems to be no longer there. What used to be in Catalina.out is now ending up being logged directly into, into syslog. Um, so this will take a minute or two. It's just downloading all its packages. Um, it's got to install, it's going to install the OpenJDK and Tomcat now. Uh, just about done. So at this point, 
It's updated some firewall rules. It's created a database. Um, done all kinds of useful things. Now we can see we've got a new container running. There's our COVID-19 container. It's just running a Tomcat. It's created a database on Postgres, which is called COVID-19 and owned by a user called COVID-19. It's just easier to, to maintain consistency throughout. But it doesn't have a war file on it. Um, in order to become useful as a, as a, um, DHS2 thing, it needs to have a war file. Ah, let me just copy from what I had before. I can take, let's take the latest 233.2. The command there is instituted DHS to deploy war minus L says you're getting it from a link, right? So this is from an HTTPS thing. And we're gonna deploy that war file to our new container, which is called COVID-19. Is download the war file, there's a quick check on it, then it's gonna deploy it. The way it deploys it is in a way that, again, is slightly more secure probably than the way that most of you are doing it. It doesn't just dump the war file into the web apps directory. It actually unpacks the war file, and makes, uh, makes the directory owned by root, so that if the application gets hacked, it can't modify itself. Uh, at this point, it's starting up. While we're waiting for it to start, because you know it can take a couple of minutes to start, let's make another one. If you want to make a few instances, you can. Let's make one. Now, if you make a new instance, you've got to give it a new IP address. Let's make COVID-19 T. The reason I'm doing COVID-19 and COVID-19 T is the one I'm going to do, try and put tracker on it, and the other one I'm going to put the aggregate on it. Unfortunately, we've got we had an issue a couple of days back where the Tracker metadata and the aggregate metadata is a little bit clashing with one another. There's some harmonization of UIDs need to happen. I'm hoping that will happen soon. Anyway, it's a good idea in general to keep your tracker separate from your aggregates. And I think most people are doing that. There might be a case if you wanted to have a, a very COVID-19 focused box that you'd put the aggregate and the tracker together on it. Um, Okay, this is doing basically the same as the other one is. While it's doing that, let's see, has the other one come alive yet? Um, reload. Uh, okay, wrong URL. It will be COVID-19. Ah, okay, there it's there. A few scary little messages first, well, there we go. Okay, so this is the first one that we created. As, as you saw, all we did, we made an instance and deployed a war file for it. So it's just going to be admin district and um, 23.230. There's our instance. We can have a look at the about page just to check that it is what we think it is. Uh, well, that, that link doesn't work. So you need to enter into one of the apps, the old apps, then you need to work. Ah, okay. All right. Never mind. Yeah, I, I, I'd read somewhere there was some problem with the about. Yeah, there's a problem with the default. Thing. Yeah. Okay. Let's not go there. <laughs> um, there's our COVID-19. By this stage, where's our COVID-19 tracker doing? Um, uh, okay. We had a problem with our COVID-19 tracker. Mm. Um, Okay, rather than try to fix it, I know why that is. I'm gonna just make a different one. Let's make a third one. Call it COVID-19 TR. The reason that gets, sometimes you see this little pause here, after I create the container and then start running the, the app update scripts and things on it, sometimes the network doesn't come up immediately and then the app get fails. I need to find a way of making that a bit more robust. I'll have to just make a third one. Okay, that's looking better. Um, okay. 
Okay, the other thing that has been configured um, behind your back, okay, the other thing you might not have noticed was configured behind the back was this, right? The SSL was set up using Let's Encrypt, right? So that was automatically pulled in um, on the basis of the domain name. You also have a very simple monitoring program on here, something called Moonin. It's not gonna show you anything interesting, um, but it's configured and ready to roll. We don't have any interesting data yet because this machine is new. We'll have a look, I'm gonna, I've just collected a couple of pictures from some, some running servers to, to show you some of the Moonin graphs. Um, looking at the graphs that you're going to get off a brand new server is not interesting okay that worked better let's deploy a war file to it much the same way um how did we do it before remember uh, history grep is my most common command I try to remember what i typed before okay there we go let's deploy a war file to our new one as well um, COVID-19 TR. So we'll put the same war file on it. That's version 233.2. And off it goes. Just looking at the time, it's 13.24 now. So it took us about 20 minutes to set up machine pretty much from blank to having your 233 instance running on it your ssl configured a little bit of monitoring happening um we created three instances though there was a problem with this one i'm not going to look at it but the tr has, has worked fine We've got three instances running. We'd have to delete the other one at some point, but this is, let's see, is it up here? That takes a while, as you know, for, um, the war file to load up. Maybe it's still running. Okay. Well, that's running. Um, I'm not gonna, not gonna show you what's on these graphs. I've just taken a few pictures really of, oh, I'll show you a little bit, it's not gonna show you much. Um, the monitoring machine here, um, monitoring itself, the Postgres machine. There are lots and lots and lots of graphs. I mean, one of the problems with, with um, Moonin is it does give you a lot of graphs. You really have to, become very adept at navigating your way around or just keep yourself some links or make a dashboard page that links to the ones that are interesting. Um, as you can see at the moment, there's not much there. The way Moonin works, it's fairly primitive. It's not as fancy as something like, like Grafana. It simply samples every five minutes. Uh, the reason why we've used it was, well, um, partly because it's really quite easy to set up it gives you really useful information for quite a small amount of effort. But as far as the configuration is concerned, um, if you look at what we started with, um, the, the plan is for that to be configurable. You see in our config file, at the moment, this is a bit hard coded, but you can specify what kind of monitoring solution you want to use. In this case, I'm using Moonin, and we specify the container called monitor, what's the type of container? It's a Moonin monitor. The idea being that over, over a bit of time, we'll also create perhaps a, a Grafana Prometheus type monitor. And then it would be a matter of in your configuration specifying different type of monitoring and then a different type of monitor to load up. Um, let's look at what some of the, the um, ah, okay. I've just made a couple of collection of little, I just grabbed these this morning from another server. Um, one of the most important things is that it really easily gives you a way of looking inside your, your JVM, right? To see, see whether you've allocated enough. For a lot of people allocate heap memory as a sort of act of faith. Or, oh no, my server is going too slow. It's crashing. Probably I need to give more heap to Tomcat or what have you. People are not using an objective measure to do it. It's really useful to have these little graphs 
basically you look at that and as long as you've got a happy amount of green free bytes it means that your heap is is operating nicely um, if you find that you're getting places in the day where that green is getting very low that's a sign that you're going to need to uh, increase your heap size um, you get a simple view of what tomcat's threads are doing um, as you can see this serve is not particularly busy it's generally running with the minimum of 10 tomcat threads every now and again it gets a bit of activity and it jumps up to um, a maximum of 24 it's looking like that's usually a sign that some of these threads are now getting quite busy and maybe getting quite slow to return right maybe they're making database queries which don't come back straight away and so the threads stay alive for longer and then you start to see an increase in your thread count something that's going to be really nice to do and i haven't done it yet is to um, go through some troubleshooting and some interpretation if you see this kind of thing in your graph that possibly means this that or the other um, because you know all monitoring solutions provide you with dozens and dozens of graphs but if you don't know what they mean it doesn't help you too much um, it also a bit of monitoring here on on your apache server this gives you a good idea of what your throughput is like whether it's um the nice thing about moonin is that you can see this daily graph but you can also see a weekly graph and a monthly graph to see where, how what your trends are over time that's very important things like disk space for example to be able to see your disk space another useful thing is monitoring your postgres and this is probably the most important graph in the whole thing because most of us who have seen performance problems on dhis2 in the end comes back to something that's happening at the database um, and this is a this is a graph here actually showing a fairly healthy performance you're looking at the total number of connections and what you want to see as you can see there's most of them are idle uh, which means as we sampled them every five minutes we're not coming across a large number of connections which are active or which are waiting for locks or, or something like that. Um, so what you'd see typically, if your database starts to become much bigger, you'll see this number of connections will start to rise. You might reach a point where you've got to think of increasing your, your pool size. Um, but as long as they're all showing orange, generally you're happy. When you start to see them showing green and blue, it means there's some problem with your database that you need to sort. It might be to do with, with the kind of locks that some people have seen happening sometimes with Tracker. It can be because of program indicators which are a bit ambitious. Um, besides actual applications, money also monitors aspects of your system. I'll just give you an example here. I mean, you, you can see the CPU and uh, uh, all kinds of things. This is looking at a disk. Um, again, this is quite an important important figure to understand what your what your latency is on your disk often when a database performance is slow it's because the underlying disk is 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 slow and often it's not a disk at all but it's it's um just some disk io that's been given to you by your vmware or by your cloud provider and this is a very good example here where we're seeing io wait times in the hundreds of milliseconds that's an example where you need to get onto your, onto your um, cloud provider in this case and say, you guys are giving me a, a crappy old disk. I've paid for SSD. The SSD, you expect to see those IO wait times more, either less than a millisecond. If it's really, really busy, you might be looking at one, two, three milliseconds, but certainly not hundreds of milliseconds. Anyway, sorry, that was just a diversion to show you what the graphing, you, you can, you get um, while we were waiting for what were we waiting for? We were waiting for COVID nineteen tracker to come up. Did it come up? Let's see. Uh, COVID nineteen tracker. Oh yeah. Okay, so we have two instances running. All right. Um, this process is something that, I mean, typically we've done a number of server academies over the years, and a couple of people here have been on some of them, I think. Um, going through all of this and then looking at the detail of what's inside of everything, it's typically 
four or five days academy, right? It's not something that easily one can go through and demonstrate over the course of an hour. But it might be a good time to stop and take a couple of questions for five minutes, and then we move on and, and let's try and throw some COVID metadata on here. Yeah, Bob, maybe if you want to start with the questions that are already in the chat, if you can open that. Okay, that's scary. I haven't been looking in the chat, I've just been talking. Yeah, we just letting let the questions pile up there for you. I'm sure there are tons. Um, how do I find the chat more? Record, leave meetings, start, participants, new share, pause share. There's a little chat bubble on the bottom. Uh, okay, I got say, say, 10 chats. Bug from, okay. <laughs> Thanks, Nick. Um, yeah, a couple of questions. Does the include, include a DB by default? Is it empty by default? Or can we provide one that we have? Oh, okay. No, no it, it, it doesn't include a DB by default. There's, there's, um, it's quite easy to deploy a DB to it, um, but it's empty. Um, how can we specify Tomcat Postcat? Okay, good. I wanted to go through a little bit where some of these files are. Um, Okay, so yeah, answer to the first question is no. It starts up with a blank blank database, um, empty by default. What you do get, um, let's let's go into it. Okay, the, we haven't done this yet, so here's our chance to see. How do you go in and see what's going on inside these containers? Well, the easiest way to do it, unless I mean, I, I, I have quite a lot of scripts which which can run commands inside the containers to do various things. But the easiest way to do this interactively is just go run bash inside a container. So you do something similar with, with Docker. Um, uh, so let's go into our Postgres container and type bash. Uh, no, sorry. <laughs> execute something inside my Postgres container. Execute what? I'm going to execute bash. And that's going to drop me to an interactive shell. Um, what is in here is um, this is something that we've talked about quite a lot of how to conf I've tried to make the configuration of the database as straightforward as possible um, in the sense that we can't really easily tune it out of the box. I know you can sort of do it by making estimates around how much RAM you can see and the like. But what I've done is just taken the the standard settings from our in, in DHIS2 implementation manual and try to put them in here. They commented out with a little bit of annotation so that to get this thing tuned properly, you would just um, probably increase your shared buffers there, increase your, your work mem, your maintenance work mem. Most of these things you'd want to keep the same. Your max connections is gonna depend on how many instances you plan to run against it. We know we need at least 80 connections for each instance. So if we had those three instances running, I'd have to up this. I'd probably up it to about 250. So where the files are, um, the files basically are inside each container. And because we've just used the standard package for each using the Ubuntu package system, uh, the files will be in the standard place that you expect to find them. Um, what I've, okay, this is maybe slightly odd. Um, normally, people go in here and they edit this postgresql.com file directly. Um, I've never been in favor of that. I've always advised people not to, because it's very hard to find out what you've done and what you haven't done, unless you keep it all under version control, which is probably a good idea. Um, but you notice this, there is a little thing at the bottom of the file that says include everything you find in this directory, conf.d. So what I've done is just group everything together. So all the configuration for your Postgres you'll find in here. This is something that ah, we've done for a number of years now in the community. Um, so the way Postgres configuration works, it the, it will override a setting by a later setting that it finds. So basically, whatever you've got in this file is going to override everything that's sitting in your PostgreSQL.conf. So the place for doing
doing your tuning is in here. So that's Postgres. Uh, Tomcat configuration and stuff like that. Yeah, very good. Let's go out to Postgres and do the same thing and go and have a look inside of one of our one of our Tomcat containers. We've got one called COVID-19. Let's go have a look. Um, a few things to know. Uh, explore this container a little bit. Um, one of the things you'll see is that um, by default, it's got firewall set up, so you can't access this container either unless you're coming from the main host. That's it, 192.168.01, or unless you're coming from the proxy. The proxy obviously needs to be able to access the Tomcat. Um, the configuration files then I have not changed from the standard Ubuntu defaults with the install. So you're going to find etc. default Tomcat 9. And that's where we've got your Java ops. I've not set anything in Java ops here yet. Um, again, it could be done, it could be done automatically, but I think we're doing enough automatic. It's probably better to set some of these things manually. But that's where you'd set your Java ops up. Your server.xml is the other important one people tend to go for, is sitting in there. Um, nothing too interesting in your server.xml, I guess. Okay, um, I've turned off the control port. Um, that's a standard security measure that everybody should be doing. Um, I've enabled the user database here. That's for the that's for the Tomcat monitoring, right? In order to be able to monitor the Tomcat, um, you need to have a a monitoring user, um, which is configured. I don't really have time to show you all the setup for it, but it happens automatically. And there's your your standard connector port, your relaxed query characters, and things like that are in there. So that's where your server.xml live. The other interesting thing is where does your DHS2 home live? Because you might have noticed when you went in there, normally with your Java ops, you're going to have to specify um, uh, your DHS2 home environment variable. Um, we don't specify a DHS2 home environment variable anywhere. That's because by default with DHS2, there's a Tom, Tom get memory or get memory for container. Okay, John, I'll come to that. Um, with DHS2, if you don't specify DHS2 home, in other words, if you just started up with no environment variable, it has a default that it'll fall back to. So from a configuration perspective, it's the best to just ignore DHS2 and let it fall, fall back to the default. And the default happens to be box DHS2. So if you're looking for your your DHS2 home, um, that's where everything lives. And again, what I've done here, again, to try to encourage people to explore and use some common options, this file has already been set up. See, the database was already created for you with a reasonable password. Um, you notice I use a username and a database name the same as the container. That just makes life simple. What have I done here? I've actually copied the DHS conf from the reference manual. Because the idea of this is not to is not to replace the, the reference manual, but more to implement it. And so we're implementing all of what we can find in the reference manual. So everything is in here for someone to go through and set um, how they might want to set it. I think the only thing that I've done Okay, I wanted to actually do this and turn it on by default because it's such a common thing. I think many performance problems are solved by having that on. <laughs> I can leave it off for the moment. So that's that file. Okay. Uh, right, Jamie, there's, there's a couple of other files I could go through, like the, the, the proxy setup, but time is a bit ticking. Um, John, on the Tomcat memory, or we give memory for container. Okay, that's that's quite a good question. Um, 
normally the most important thing you're going to set on your on your um Tomcat container is going to be your heap size right you're going to have to stab in i guess at a heap what heap size you're going to need here um sorry i don't have it it's minus xmx and then maybe we give it eight gig um so here you'd specify the heap size um to use the good thing about doing that is that you can then watch it and usually I, when i when i set it up for the first time if it's in a production environment you watch it very very carefully the first couple of days and you see did i give it too much heap i don't need that much or did i give it too little in terms of how much memory the container has itself by default if you don't do anything and i haven't done anything um there's no per container limit supplied um those can be applied I'll, I'll do one i might want to for example i've only got eight gig i think on this machine oh, three minus m minus h uh, i've only got four gig on this machine right um i want to be careful with these containers that they're not going to um interfere with one another's memory one of the things that you can do is you can say um lxc config um take a container let's say the one we have that's not doing anything um config set config set on i'll document this stuff somewhere um in 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 the documentation but let's take if we wanted to limit the memory on this we can do it like this limits dot memory now make sure this thing can only use one gigabyte um lxe config set huh? covid covid t uh let me doing these things live i get that config set no, i'm doing it the wrong way around uh config set i do it there set a container i thought i'd had that right the first time config set the name of the container which was covid tr limit dot memory or limits dot memory and I, i'll put this in the documentation after i'm i'm having a a brain freeze trying to do it live but yeah you can limit the memory to of your individual containers you can also limit the number of cpus that your individual containers have access to and that's typically something that again i don't do it as part of the setup i rather first of all let every everything use whatever it can find and then you monitor it carefully over a day or two or three and after you've done that you get a better idea of what you can and should restrict okay um nick should i quickly try and put some COVID 19 on here yeah that would be great don't know if it'll work <laughs> it should work <laughs> it's not very well rehearsed the problem i had as i said um um my script got broken okay i just at least i've 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 captured the history here um so let's try and set up aggregate so basically i'm going to pull the aggregate metadata here and just try and post it um try and post it into our container there let's go through there is it check this carefully our container is called it is called COVID 19 isn't it if i remember correctly okay so i'm just pulling ah no no this is not the COVID 19 metadata i'm going to pull some org units first you know there's a, a lot of if you're bootstrapping a system like this um you're going to need to get your org units from somewhere most commonly you're going to get it from your own hmis system the hmis system act as a kind of de facto facility registry in a lot of in a lot of um, jurisdictions you might have a proper facility registry somewhere and you'd pull them from there but okay what i'm doing here i'm just pulling the the org units from play 
always a risky thing to do. And try to push them. Oh, there we go. And that looks like, yeah, lots of created. Yeah, okay. That looks like we now have org units. Um, go and check that. Do we have org units? Uh, let's make sure we get our right instance. It's getting confusing. Okay, admin district. Did a lot of fiddling around with these parameters and a lot of discussion with Morton and all about whether we get the GIS stuff in or not. But I think this does get the GIS in. Um, easy way to check. Let me go to the maps, see if I can get boundaries. Um, add ourselves a layer. Uh, let's just see what boundaries we have. It is thinking. What is it thinking about? It's loading your unit hierarchy, I guess. Doing it kind of slow. Uh, leave it thinking for a bit. Let's go back to the, let's try and get some metadata in. The meta, okay, this one here. This will pull the aggregate, all the aggregate data and metadata and push it in. Whether you do this from the front end or the back end, I guess doesn't make, I think most of the guidance and stuff is about doing it from the front end. Obviously, if you're, if you're installing this system from scratch, then um, you might as well curl the stuff in like I'm doing here. Let's try that and push in the the aggregate metadata. That looks like it worked as well, yeah. Okay, this didn't. So now, something we need to check there. It might be something Nick was telling me about. My admin user probably needs to be assigned to the root of the org unit hierarchy. Let's just have a quick look. a bit slow this is this is this be running in a very very tiny environment here right with with three hmm, so well, that's too slow why is maintenance giving me so slow I don't know um, I need to check that. Um, I can't see why. That's not loading. We need to go and check in the logs to see. Um, it worked when I did it yesterday. <laughs> Other odd things happening here. I'm getting not secure. I don't know what that's about. Um, there must be, must be some resources on this page which are not coming under HTTPS. Mm. Okay, I don't know. Sorry, the the importing of the COVID metadata and stuff, we still need to test. We tested it all yesterday and it worked well. Obviously, it needs to be tested some more. Um, but I think the main point, as I said, these tools, it's not really about it's not really about COVID-19 specifically. It's about setting up an environment where you got reasonably strong security applied to all of your particular components. As I say, my Apache configuration took me about a week going through all the CIS benchmarks and trying to fix whatever I could. Similarly, the Tomcat is, is reasonably securely set up. And to make that uh, sort of out of the box experience, that by default, you follow as much of the best practices as possible. Let me stop there again and see if there are any questions before I embarrass myself with more things that don't work. And I just want to say anyone who hasn't typed a question in the chat can also use the raise hand function that should be at the bottom of your screen. And we'll just uh, call on you if you have a question you want to ask live. 
Yeah, Tuzo has fixed my... <laughs> Thanks, Tuzo. This is the way you limit your memory. LXE config set postcode limits dot memory equals. What I did wrong? I think I'm bad. Okay, good. Thanks, John. You might need to check your user. Should you? And I, yeah, I, I need to go to my user. Um, so when you want me to start again, it won't assign to old unit. Yeah. Um, promise. How do I do that? Because I need to get to my. I need to get to my maintenance app to do that. My maintenance app is not coming up. I can edit the user, yeah, I can do that. Um, this is great. Everybody in the in the audience is telling me what I need to do. That's the kind of viewership that you want. There is something which is unhappy about this. I mean, that's not. Something is not right. Okay, without going to look at the log files, when all else fails, let's just reboot the thing anyway. Okay, we'll just restart our COVID-19 instance. We're gonna have a look at it again. Um, when I did this yesterday, it was fine. I could go into the maintenance app. I could see the user. I could see the, I could see the org units. And then I was able to assign my user to the org unit. Hmm. We'll have to wait a few minutes for that to come up. Has anybody asked me anything else? Or giving me more advice. Yeah, access via user app. Thanks, Stephen. Yeah, that's what I was trying to do. <laughs> Does anyone want to ask me anything about the the, the actual service setup um, while we're waiting for this? There are quite a few people on this group who've been using uh the, the this way of doing it already i know steven is a bit of an expert um tuzo is a bit of an expert clement um john has raised a hand oh, okay john yeah like you need to give the access to speak everyone is mute bob you need to learn about the uh, zoom yeah, Max, Max is operating the Zoom, I think. I'm just talking. I'm the, uh, I'm the Zoom dictator of this meeting. Yeah, thanks. Um, uh, Bob, like, I just see like it's most of the things have been done um, at the different script, right? Yeah. And it's been installed in uh, different places. So are these things, um, is been currently documented somewhere or you are going to? No, they are, well, they, they are being currently documented somewhere. Um, I've been I've been at it all week. <laughs> Carry on towards the end of the week. Um, um, you see, the thing with with the like with the likes of the Postgres container and the Apache container, what have you, they're all they're all in their standard places. Um, so, in a sense, that's quite useful. You can you can you can they they should not be clashing with what you read with the official reference documentation for those packages. But the piece of documentation that I need to write now um, is going through um, all of the particular configuration files, where they are and how you access them. Uh, yeah, no, that's fine. Them. Yeah, I've started uh, that's fine. that, I've not completed. No, no, I'm not talking about that one, like especially for the script, you know, instead of like loading a uh, uh, COVID, you can also load a um, uh, restore database, right? So I, I, I guess yeah. like you all have a script for the restore database. Sorry? And you have the, the, the man help in the, in the script, right? So we can just like say uh, man or, or just a... Um, you will, will do the next, next, next couple of days, that'll be there. Currently, yeah, there are a couple of utility scripts that have been installed on the user local bin. I've got to make new man pages for them. Um, 
Um, an interesting one that DG, DJHS2 DB activity. Um, this is a really useful diagnostic script. I, I was running it so much that I decided to just include it in my package. What this does is it just takes a look at, a lot of you may have seen this before where you're looking in your PG stat activity table inside Postgres to find out what queries are actually running at any particular time, um, what queries which are not idle. Um, so running that now is where you just have to go sudo dhs to db activity. Um, and there's, it's not finding any active queries. It wouldn't because the system is so quiet. But yeah, ideally what you want to have, and you will have, I've just got to write these things. With part of the install, we should install the man pages with it, like we had from before. You go man, and it'll give you what you need. Yeah, just uh, just uh, the syntax will be, uh, be fine for now. Yeah, just, I mean, the, the, the man, man pages don't have to be very long. There's a little synopsis of what the syntax is. Um, but I mean, focusing on, on ironing out all the little bugs around the install, around the installer, because it's installing quite a lot of stuff, and lots of little gotchas. I think I've ironed out most of them now, um, but I got broken again um, just two hours ago. Because um, as you know, I'm using Apache. There are some people who are fond of Nginx. Um, um, I'm not particularly, but uh, mm. Tuzo contributed a package for uh, of, uh, a, a, a container setup for Nginx, but unfortunately I didn't test it properly before committing, and so I found out two hours ago that it was breaking a few things. But yeah, that, that, that'll be easily fixed. So you could have an option of using either Apache or Nginx, but of course that also requires more documentation. So I'm going to keep on documenting my Apache, and I'm sure Tuzo will take on the responsibility of keeping on documenting the Nginx version. My last question, can we use your script right now? In a, or do, we, do you ask us to wait a bit more? No, you can use it right now. I have you. Well, okay. Um, you could have used it two hours ago. Um, I would have just check again that I've fixed the stuff that got broken. Um, but yeah, no, I, I have. I have been using it. That's how I'm getting all the bugs ironed out of it. You can take a blank machine, just like what I, what I put up here, and follow those instructions carefully in the README, um, and it will all work just like you've seen here. Great. Thanks. Anything else? Are we over time? Anything, any questions left in the chat? Oh, I see one. Thanks a lot, Bob. Maybe you want to mention which ask. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. But, but Jamie unfortunately tried this thing out this morning or, or, or yesterday on Debian and it didn't work. Um, yeah, currently all of these scripts have only been tested on Ubuntu version 18.04, okay? I have no intention of backporting back to Ubuntu 16.04. I think anybody who's on that should probably consider moving forwards. Ubuntu 20.04 is going to be around the corner next month. So yeah, we'll, we'll test them and release a version for Ubuntu 20.04. Um, it doesn't currently work out of the box on, on, on Debian. It would be much easier to make it work on Debian than it would be to make it work on, on Red Hat. Um, that would be quite a different prospect. So yeah, Tim, if there's, a, if there's a sufficient interest and demand for doing it on Debian, um, I'll certainly put a little bit of effort to make that work. But for the moment, I think we've got enough to do um, getting everything really watertight on 18.04. I've kind of I've targeted what I guess is the, the mode. 
what what most people will probably use uh, as a starting point.